friends. This is the tenth time probably my visit to Ahmedabad from 1944 onwards from Karachi twice, then from Delhi and Calcutta several times. I have come here and gone to many other cities of Gujarat also. This time the invitations came from Kalro asking me to give this Dr. Vikram Sarabhai Memorial Lectures. I have not met him, but I have met his mother and Marunadini. I was her guest some years ago when I came here. And I knew the greatness of Vikram, not only as a scientist, but as a humanist, and he has done great work for the nation. That immediately made me accept the invitation. Though I have been asked by my doctors to cut down all these tours and lectures, etc. But this one attraction of the name of Vikram Sarabhai and the people of Amrabad made me accept this invitation. I am speaking on a memorial lecture of a great scientist. As I said, also is a humanist. So the subject that is chosen now is a combination of all the various streams of knowledge which man seeks. Broadly we speak of science, art, religion and then social thought. So these two subjects have been framed from that point of view. Human uniqueness in the light of modern science. That is one subject human uniqueness in the light of ancient Vedanta. Through this, you will get plenty of material to think about. Actually, lectures like this are meant to stimulate thought in various directions. And these two subjects together constitute practically the whole gamut of human thought. Science dealing with the external world, the sensory world. Vedanta dealing with that plus the depth of the human spirit, for the depth dimension of this human being. These two together constitute the whole range of human knowledge. That is our point of view in India, not in the West yet, and we should know our point of view. We are all educated on the basis of Western experience. That experience is always full of conflict. Conflict between science and religion. Conflict between religion and religion. This is the nature of Western experience. Not so in India. That we do not know. We know only the Western experience. But as soon as we understand that experience of India, where knowledge cannot conflict with knowledge. All are knowledge only. Therefore, from the Upanishads, we had this wonderful idea. All human knowledge belongs to two categories. One is called Aparavidya, the other is called Paravidya. Ordinary knowledge, extraordinary knowledge. The teacher telling the student, Vidya in Sanskrit means literally science. That's meaning of Vidya. And the word science in English also means knowledge. That's all. So two types of Vidya to be acquired by every human being said the teacher to the student 4,000 years ago in the Mundaga Upanishad. Dve vidye vedita vye iti hasmayat dhemma vidho vadanti parachaiva aparacha. See, wonderful, comprehensive vision expressed in these words. Two types of sciences are there to be studied by every human being. One is called aparavidya, the other is called Paravidya. In the next verse, the teacher explains what he means by this apara and para. All positivistic knowledge is called aparavidya, knowledge based on sense data. All that we see the world outside, we study, understand them. All that vidya is vidya, but it is called aparavidya. Then what is paravidya? 
that is beautiful definition given the Vata Para Yaya Tadaksharam Adhigam Yate. This world which we study is a changing universe. Nothing remains constant. The continuous change going on all the time. Is there a changeless behind the changing? Is there a changeless reality behind this world of change? If so, the science dealing with that subject will be known as Paravidya. Atha para yaya tad aksharam imperishable is realized. These are the two sciences that we have to study. That is the Indian approach. So that we don't get conflict with modern science. We welcome it. We accept it. And we want to understand what it can do for human development. And we have our own vidya developed here in a big way. That paravidya. That's what you get in the Upanishads. Now go to the West. It is quite different. Constant conflict. In fact, science has developed always opposed by religion. The concept of religion in the West, concept of paravidya in the West, was narrow, dogmatic, intolerant. Intolerant of emerging science. Intolerant of other religions. Intolerant of one's own sex denominations. That is the Western experience. Don't treat it as universal experience. Only Western. And so what happened? From 16th century onwards, this scientific mind begins. Actually, it began towards the end of the 15th century. The West developing a scientific temper, a scientific outlook, a scientific search. It was opposed by religion at that time. It's very interesting to hear about the history of modern scientific development in the West. I read in a book about the end of the 15th century in the Oxford University Library, a number of scholars sat and discussed how many teeth a horse has. They were discussing. As they did in those days, they always consulted books. Let us go to the library, take books, consult how many teeth a horse has. And the books that were most consulted was Aristotle. So they went on searching, searching. Just at that time, one young scholar quietly left the room. Nobody noticed his leaving. After a few minutes, he re-entered the room. This time nobody could miss noticing him because he brought a live horse into the hall. Addressing the whole scholar, gentlemen, you want to know how many teeth the horse has? Here the horse opened his mouth, see how many teeth it has. Now to us it looks very ordinary, but to those scholars it was the most impertinent act of this particular young man because Aristotle is the supreme authority. This man said, by authority, study nature directly, get the knowledge of it. There you can see the breeze of science blowing slowly, gently, but opposed every time by traditional knowledge, especially theology of the West. Then you have seen the history, how, how many scientists have to pay with their life to develop science there. So throughout the West, this development continued. One great idea that was there in the religion of Western people is the uniqueness of man. Man is a special creation of the divine. But scientists never accepted it. They never believed in that idea of this uniqueness of the human being as a special creation. Just like anything else in the world, man also is part of the universal process. This concept became proclaimed in the next century, that is 19th century, by Darwin, by proclaiming the theory of evolution. Remember, this evolutionary theory is 4,000 years old in India. The Sankhya philosophy, Vedanta philosophy, they fully accept the concept of evolution. From Brahman, the whole universe has evolved. The word Srishti in Sanskrit doesn't mean creation. It means projection. Just like a spider brings out the web out of itself and builds a web and stays in it, so Brahman has produced this universe out of himself and he is living within it, not outside. That is a Vedantic statement. Now for us, there is nothing strange about it. But the reaction of the West against Darwin's proclamation of the theory of evolution was terrible. They began to shout at all the scientists, 
Darwin also started shouting at that time. And so, this conflict between emerging science and entrenched religious dogma represents Western development in this matter. So when he chose a name for his book, he chose this particular name, The Descent of Man. Man is descended from the monkey. And so theologians became terribly angry. And controversies that took place at that time, that went 1859 up to the end of the century. If you study Western history, you will find plenty of controversy about this man being degraded it's a special creation of the divine. This man has made a mess of it, like that it came. The descent of man. This is one part of the story. The second part is very interesting. From Descartes onwards, at the 17th century, Western science has developed by eliminating the human being from the study. We shall study only the object, the world as object, sense data. They study them. And man is completely eliminated from that study. Man as knower, man as subject is completely eliminated. Objective study as they call it. This is what was done there all through up to this 20th century. Only the world outside we shall study. Man has no place in our study. He is out. He is to be eliminated. That's the language they use there. Now, when, Einstein, when Darwin spoke about the descent of man, today's biology reconsiders this question in a new light. After all these hundred years of evolution, you find a new approach coming to the subject and that is given by Sir Julian Huxley, the famous British biologist who died just a few years ago. He was the dominating figure in a congress of scientists in the Chicago University in 1959, celebrating centenary of Darwin. In that centenary, a seven-day seminar, real study of the developments of evolutionary theory from Darwin up to date, was considered. Plenty of panel discussions, everything was there. Special highlights were the speeches by Sir Julian Huxley, according to the editor of the proceedings of the whole conference, known as Evolution After Darwin, 100 Years of Evolution a three-volume publication by the Chicago University. Sol Tax was the editor. That editor says that this whole conference was dominated by Sir Julian Huxley. Everybody looked up to him for guidance. What did Huxley say in that wonderful conference? His own grandfather defended Darwin against the theologians of the time, Thomas Huxley, a free thinker, agnostic, Keen intellectual. In this, grandson comes, he gives a new interpretation of the whole theory of evolution. For hundred years, there has been tremendous progress in biology. And what is the picture of the world? What is the picture of this human situation arising from this study of hundred years? He was dealing with that subject. One famous subject he took for a lecture, the evolutionary vision. What is the vision of the whole human situation coming from evolutionary biology. Then emergence of evolution, another wonderful subject. In all these subjects, one central theme is the uniqueness of man. That uniqueness that was overthrown by Darwin because it was theological without any scientific basis. Now comes that uniqueness once again into science through the developments in biology hundred years of biology. So Julian Huxley referred to there are more things about man so far as uniqueness is concerned. And today we want to establish that uniqueness of man, but from a new angle, a scientific angle. That was theological angle. This is arising from evolution itself. We speak of the uniqueness of man. Actually, there is a book entitled Uniqueness of Man by Sir Julian Huxley and many others also discussed the subject in that particular conference. He has given a new direction to evolution in that conference that pre-human evolution was called organic evolution. Organic evolution had only three criteria. One is organic satisfaction, second is organic survival 
and organic continuity. These are the only criteria. But Sir Julian Huxley says, in this 20th century biology, we consider that at the human stage, these three become secondary. Something else becomes primary at the human stage because there is a uniqueness of the human being. What is that new criterion? Fulfillment is the criterion. Are you fulfilled? Is what evolution asks every human being, not whether you had organic satisfaction, etc. That is only secondary. This is primary. This is a wonderful change that comes from the development that took place in biology during the last hundred years. Then also he made a beautiful remark in the conference. He said, when this evolutionary theory was expounded by Darwin in 59, 1859, this fight with religion was going on. They took a name for his book which contains that kind of a situation to fight against religion. So, he used the word, the descent of man. Man is descended from so and so. Julian Huxley says, that was not a scientific title. Because of the religious opposition, that title was taken. But actual title should have been the ascent of man. What a wonderful word. The ascent of man. There has been progress. The word progress had no place in science. No place in biology till then. Now they say progress has to be accepted. It is there. So it is the ascent of man and not the descent of man. Even the choosing of a name was conditioned by religious controversy that took place at that time. Incidentally, I may mention, there is a second book called The Dis Ascent of Woman. It is a wonderful book. The new book is there. The Ascent of Woman. That is also. Not in this context, but I am telling you separately. So in this way, Huxley proclaimed there, the goal of evolution at the human stage is fulfillment. The organism seeks fulfillment. What you call in Sanskrit, Purnatha. Are you fulfilled? That is the one question. Are you integrated? Are you fulfilled? Purnata. Then he said, if you want to keep fulfillment as the goal, you need a new science to guide humanity towards that fulfillment. What is that science? And he coins a beautiful phrase, the science of human possibilities. We have the science of the physical possibilities. What are the possibilities hidden in this nature outside? We have got atomic possibilities, nuclear possibilities, many other possibilities are there, so far as physical nature is concerned. But what are the possibilities hidden in this human being? We don't know anything. Physical science doesn't know anything. We know only some of the possibilities, like any human being, that we can work, we can change the world a little, all that we know. But all the possibilities rest, we do not know. So, he wanted a new science to develop. Tomorrow, when you hear Vedanta, you will find it exactly as he described the science of human possibilities. Along with the science of physical possibilities, which modern science is, we have the science of human possibilities, which Vedanta is, which has developed consciously like any, any other science in India by the great sages of the Upanishads. And so, in this Julian Huxley presentation of the subject, there are beautiful ideas. One special idea, you must remember, that organic evolution has no place when evolution has come to the human level. You don't need nature to create new organs for you because nature has given you this cerebral system with which you can invent any organs you need. You want to fly, you can build up an airplane. You don't want beings to develop in your body. That's called organic evolution. This is evolution created by your own intelligence. And so we must seek for evolution at the human stage, the higher stage, not at the lower stage of organic evolution. That ended when the first man appeared on the scene. So what is the goal of evolution? What is the nature of evolution at the human stage? He has coined a new phrase, psychosocial evolution. This human psyche and its context of society around you, there you evolve. Psyche can be detached from this organic system and expanded in love and compassion and sympathy. There you have organic evolution, what we referred to earlier as the moral, ethical development of the human being. So today's evolution stresses psychosocial evolution, organic evolution is secondary. Why all this? Because of the uniqueness of man. Man is unique, 
in more ways than one, he says in his famous book, that book I shall be referring to earlier, a later book, he wrote to me about that book in one of his letters, that I have given the best of my knowledge on the subject in that book. His title is Evolution, a Modern Synthesis, published about 48 or 58 or so at that time. New editions also have come. In that book, a few passages are there, which I shall quote to you in the course of my lecture. But the stress is that this human being has a certain unique feature within himself, within herself. In the course of evolution, these developments took place. Even from mammals, this evolution started on new lines. Take, for example, one tremendous feature of evolution during the mammal period. The early mammals had no equilibrium of temperature within the body. Daytime, they are full of activity. Nighttime, the nerves, nervous system becomes weak and no activity at all because there is no conditioning within the system of equilibrium of temperature. So nature found that doesn't help for survival. So in the later mammals, nature evolved the system called thermostatic equilibrium within, within the animal body. Whatever be the temperature outside, body has a uniform temperature. We have inherited that thing from the later mammals. But many more things have happened in our system. You can see the blood becoming changed in the course of work by exhausting some of its ingredients. But the blood again brings back that blood into its own proper equilibrium state. This totality of equilibrium within the body is known as homeostasis in biology. This homeostatic condition is a tremendous condition nature developed in the later mammals and perfected in the human being. Out of that came the evolution of the cerebral system. From the mammals up to man, due to this homeostatic condition, nature could evolve this wonderful instrument of all development, namely the cerebral system. In human being, that has become a perfect instrument for carrying evolution onward. Then Huxley will say, nature has no more functions to perform in evolution. Now man has taken from nature the capacity to continue evolution further. We can't depend upon nature hereafter. That is over with the animal world. Human world, man remains supreme. He has the capacity to change the world. No animal has changed the environment. Only man can change the environment well or ill. He can destroy the environment or you can build it well. It's all according to the human being. That means values come at the stage of human being. Before that, no values were not there. Values, what kind of values man is taking in? Will he become the destroyer of the civilization because of his new power? What is that power? What is it that makes man dominant? This subject, when Huxley discusses, he comes close to Vedanta. He doesn't know much of Vedanta, but he comes close to Vedanta because that is our special subject in our country from the Upanishads onwards. He says, in this human being, there is a new development by which he is able to dominate the whole of nature. A little new datum appears in the human system. In English, we call it the ego, the self, the I, the simple I. In no animal, you have this particular datum, this I. Even the newborn baby has not desire. After two or three, two and a half years, slowly the ego appears in the human child. That's a tremendous datum. It is this that makes a human being dominate the whole of nature. You can see a child at five or six controlling buffaloes, horses, even elephants, what is common between the two? Physically, this is nothing compared to that big animal, but he controls it. There must be some secret source of energy and power within that human being. This is the beginning of a tremendous evolutionary advance by man to higher levels. This is only an initial datum, a little self, little projection of ego within the human system. Out of this came new powers, power of thinking, power of reason, power of judgment, above all, power of speech communication. Out of this came a new wonderful fruit of evolution, namely culture. Animals have no culture. Man alone has culture because he can not only experience life but transmit it to future generations. 
through literature, through communication, through art, through all these things. Therefore, culture becomes a new factor when you deal with evolution at the human stage. Previously, just purely physical conditioning of the animal physical system. But at the stage of man, you have also this culture coming in the picture. We have two sets of inheritances in every human being. One is the genetic inheritance which we share with the animals. Animals have only genetic inheritance. Everything is coded in the genetic system. Nothing new is necessary. But in the case of man, along with the genetic inheritance, we find also this cultural inheritance that 5,000 years ago, the sages taught something. Today, it is your property. You have got a cumulative culture knowledge with you. So culture is defined as mind duplicating itself. What a beautiful conception. Mind duplicating itself is called culture. Just like cell duplicating itself is called the physical development. That is a wonderful definition there. Matter duplicating itself is physical life. Mind duplicating itself is culture. So man has both these inheritances. Between the two, says biology today, physical inheritance or genetic inheritance is fixed and final. You can alter it. But cultural inheritance is more malleable. You can alter, you can enrich, you can develop, all this you can do. That's why education plays a great part at the human level. At the animal level, education is over in one hour. As soon as a calf is born, within one hour, his education is over. But in the case of a human child, long education, because culture is a tremendous value inherited. He can accept what is given in the past, strengthen it, we give it to the next generation better. So every human being has this double inheritance, physical, that is genetic, cultural, which is more malleable. All conservatism comes from the dominance of the genetic over the cultural. All liberal free attitudes come from dominance of the cultural over the genetic. Take, for example, racial inequality, racial superiority, entirely the domination of the genetic over the cultural. Progress in human life comes when the genetic is controlled and the cultural is given free play. Then only progress and development becomes possible. Now, these are ideas coming from the science of biology in this later part of the 20th century. Before that, it was not there. So many new ideas have started coming. And so the basis is uniqueness of man. These new values have come. One particular capacity of the human mind, which neurology especially stresses, is the capacity for imagination. It's a wonderful word. Imagination means capacity for image making. Just before you act, act in your mind the situation and then act. That's called imagination. That means trying to figure out in the mind all the situations and reactions before you actually physically react. That's called image making capacity. That is what made man dominant in the whole of nature. Gray Walter was a famous British neurologist. He has written a book, The Living Brain. In that book, he especially mentions this, that this human child has this capacity to imagine the situation. You get a stimulus, the animal immediately sends out a response. A human being gets a stimulus, looks at it, imagine, imagines it, then sends out a response. That little change made for a tremendous difference between the animal and man. You can now control the situation around it. Saying this in that book on living brain, Grey Walter says with a smile, if you don't accept what I say, then consider if the lion or the tiger had developed this capacity for imagination, what would have been the result? You and I won't be here to answer that question. They would have dominated everything. So this wonderful focus is a wonderful datum. We must know what is it. The little ego that comes within us in a baby, strong, it becomes in a human being, and you grow up, what is his significance? What is his real dimension? This is just a hint and a suggestion given in modern biology. But if you want to know more about it, go to the Upanishads, go to Vedanta. Science brings a subject and gives it at the feet of Vedanta. You study further. There is no conflict. It is a continuous knowledge. Con you study further. 
there is no conflict it is a continuous knowledge continuous external world you study finishing that you ask this question what is this human being what is this self what is true nature we don't know anything and they got and all physical science told you to eliminate man from scientific investigation but now man comes back once again one of the greatest things that have happened in physical science during the last 90 or about 90 years including the science which Dr. Vikram Sarabhai also studied and, and worked on, namely nuclear science, is the evidence of man and his consciousness on the field of science. Till now there was no place at all. Human consciousness, human mind, man as subject had no place here. Only the object they study, eliminating the subject. But both in biology and in physics, man appears as a very prominent datum in our subject of study of the nature of consciousness. You can't establish any truth about nuclear phenomena without referring to the consciousness of the observer is a constant utterance in modern nuclear science. The very observation itself will alter the phenomena. Therefore, the observer has an important place to play in the nuclear study. Now, what is the observer? What is the nature? We don't know anything. Julian Huxley says, they have only scratched the surface of this great science. What is within this human being? And neurology also studied this subject. What a change early neurology. And now we had a psychology hundred years ago known as behaviorism. Watson of America developed the behavioristic psychology. Man studied like any animal because that was the theory of the 19th century. First, Newtonian mechanics. Everything is machine. And so, animals are machines. Man also is a machine. Man is also an animal, an animal also is a machine. That is the philosophy of science in the 19th century. The whole thing has changed today. The new dimension of the human being is tremendously impressed upon by both physics as well as biology. And physics, as I have already said, without reference to consciousness, you cannot understand nuclear phenomena. But so far as biology is concerned, it is closer. Physics is dealing with the subject far away. Biology deals with you and me, our living structure. What is the speciality that is here? That is something wonderful. This little datum, the eye, what does it mean? Long ago, 1920s, they wrote a book, The Science of Life, about 900 pages, by H.G. Wells, D.P. Wells, and Julian Huxley. So at the end of the book, there is a beautiful section, the philosophical implications of modern biology. In that section, there is another section known as the status of the ego in evolution. Just imagine 1920, the status of the ego in evolution. There it is said, a very poetic passage you, come, you get there. Alone, and the silence of the night, and on a score of thoughtful occasions, we have demanded that this ego which is so central to my universe, without which we cannot understand the world, does it ever cease to be? Yet, in sleep, the ego completely disappears. We don't know how it comes back to an awareness of its own existence. Then he continues, personality centered in the ego, Maybe, in other words, maybe one of nature's devices, a convenient, provisional solution of considerable strategic value in evolution. See the language, a considerable strategic value in evolution, the ego has the provisional solution. That means, you must transcend it, you must transcend it. Then, the author say, this is the essence of much of mysticism and mystical philosophy. The ego must be transcended. There is something higher than the ego. That is the suggestion given in the 20th of the century. Today, biology takes the subject still further and dealing with the human situation says you cannot explain human situation without bringing in the concept of values, ethical values, humanistic values, all these things are absolutely necessary to understand the human situation. We can deal with animals without question of value. 
if a donkey uh, kicks you, and you don't say donkey is wicked for you. That is his nature, he is wicked. So, but in you, how the nature is present, not only that nature which is studied there, some new dimension has come here, take account of that. That is why ethical judgment is possible only where there is freedom. Where there is no freedom, there is no ethical judgment. In man, a little freedom has come. A freedom of choice has come. A little free will has come. Therefore, you can say whether you have done right or you have done wrong. Values come in at the human state. On that subject, I would like to read a few words from that great book, The Revolution, The New Synthesis. He referred to me the known letter about this book. From here, I have given my best thought on this subject in this particular book. About eight to nine hundred pages are there. There he mentions here, he says, page 566 in that book, to, that towards the end of the book, the philosophical implications of biology come clear. Otherwise, details of evolution and speciation, all this will get earlier. Human values are doubtless essential criteria for the steps of any human progress, but only biological values can have been operative before man appeared. At that time, biological values. Now, non-biological values, ethical values, moral values, spiritual values, aesthetic values, all this come into the picture. The value gets a place in science. There is no place till then. Now, you cannot escape. At the human level, values become central. Then he continues. As regards human progress, it is clear the subjective criteria cannot and should not be neglected. Not merely objective criteria. Human values and feelings must be taken into account in deciding on the future aims for advance. But in comparing human with pre-human progress, we must clearly stick to objective standards. I would thus like to make a distinction between biological or evolutionary progress and human progress. That was automatic. Science, nature blindly went on. Here, you are choosing a goal you fix. You have got an independent mind. Therefore, he says, a distinction between biological or evolutionary progress and human progress. The former is a biological term with an objective basis. It includes one aspect of human progress. Of course, biological progress also is there, so as man is concerned, we are a bit physical yet. Human progress, on the other hand, has connotations of value, as well as efficiency, as subjective, as well as objective. Having said it, says the evolutionary biology is a beautiful passage is coming. A passage in many religious books in India, you will find that sentence, but you find here, the animal within you must go. Then only the real man can grow. That's what we say always. Don't be like an animal. That means thoughtless uh, creature. The word creature means one who is shaped by forces outside of oneself. That's called a creature. In Sanskrit, called Jantu. In many books you will read, don't be a Jantu. Don't be a Jantu. Be free. Be free. Take your life. Develop it yourself. That theory is mentioning here a beautiful passage. The evolutionary biologist is tempted to ask whether the aim should not be to let the mammal die within us so as the more effectively to permit the man to live in us. The mammal must die, then the man will function more and more. So automatism goes away. Everything is planned, development of the human individual. Having said this, the future of progressive evolution is the future of man. Here you have the greatest development of human evolution. So, in this case, you will find Huxley and modern biology take the human being, something unique in this human being. We don't know exactly what that unique is, but it gives you new powers. Powers which you can use to destroy the whole of nature, destroy universal health. You are seeing the continuation of the same science. The physical scientific attitude of such for truth is continued at the human level and it discovered something profound within the human being which it activated tremendous values will flow into human life. That is why the whole 
scientific thought stands today, poised for a great advance towards a deeper level of understanding of the human situation. Huxley is very clear, we have studied very little of the human mind. In neurology, big advanced subject today, this subject is being studied from a new point of view. Till now we were studying neurology from the outside, studying the behavior and reaction of the human system to this. Now you have what you call a new type of brain surgery, keep open the brain and do surgery. And one step more, talk to the patient along with operation, because brain has no pain, so you can cut open the whole top and then doctor is busy operating, talking to the patient. Now that was done by the great Wilder the Penfield of Montreal Neurological Institute, he passed away a few years ago. He has wonderful things to say on the subject. And what all he says is what you get in the Upanishad. Slowly, slowly it is coming. That apart from the brain, there is a mind behind the brain. In his book you will find The Nature of Man by this Penfield. Apart from the brain, there is a mind. The tendency was to convert everything into the brain only. There is nothing but the brain, nothing physicality only. Nothing more than physicality is there. But today's neurology slowly begins to discover through investigation by talking to the patient. One side is the electrode where the place it is kept in a particular part of the brain. Then talking with the patient. Whatever neurons act in the brain, you get through your machine. Then a part of the neuron action, the mind is functioning within this patient. So they found you cannot explain his behavior unless you posit a mind behind the brain, just like we posit a telephone operator behind the telephone. The exact word he has chosen. There is a telephone operator behind the telephone. Similarly, in the brain, brain is an instrument. It's not the actual mind. It is something behind. These are the conclusions come from modern neurology through actual experiment in surgery. Now, what exactly the nature of this mind? On that subject, I said, you know, uh, is saying, we have only scratched the surface of this great subject. We don't know much about it. And that is exactly the subject our people took up. What I call the senses reveal the world around you. We call them data. Those data we study, draw conclusions, control the situation, all the six physical signs. But science itself is not confined to physical. Science can be non-physical also. Physical or non-physical. Science must be science. What is that? Search for truth. Never ask, take things for granted. Give for verification or falsification, as one scientist would say. If you can falsify a thing and if you can stand that falsification, then only it is scientific truth. Formerly we used only verification. Now there is falsification also. And therefore, we ask this question. Any subject that can be approved scientifically must be able to answer questions, probe, search, and fully satisfied accept it as truth. That search for truth is what we need in the world of religion. Normal religion doesn't do so. Only belief, only doctrine, only dogma, and don't question. If you question, they all collapse. Imagine the Upanishad developing a type of spiritual thought entirely based on questioning, investigation, and re-verification. I'm not asking you to believe. Go ahead. Search for yourself. Throughout our history, we never placed belief as a criterion of true religion. It is experience. That's a wonderful subject. So, today's scientific knowledge is taking you to a deeper world of inquiry. That is exactly the situation. The mystery of physical nature is overshadowed the mystery of man himself. This wonderful mystery, tomorrow's subject will be this, and the whole Western world today is eager to understand that subject. After all, a scientist is a seeker of truth. Sometimes they may have certain prejudices, dogmas, they are carried away, some individual. Science itself is not carried away like that. But more scientists are coming with an open mind, what lies next, what lies next, so that they, in Hyderabad, the all, all India Neurological Conference. They invited me to inaugurate it. I gave it inaugural address. That book is available by Bharti Vidya Bhavan. Neurology and what lies beyond. It's a wonderful subject. They're all eager to hear. 
and they were very interested in that theme. So tomorrow's subject will be human uniqueness in the light of ancient Vedanta. This is modern science. That is ancient science dealing with man. When you deal with man, you deal with the physical body, yes, physiology, anatomy, neurology, and brain. All these are study of man, but they do not exhaust. Still deeper, still deeper. That deep study our sages undertook, yeah, the scientific mind, that will be the theme for tomorrow's lecture in the light of Vedanta. Most of us do not know this tremendous heritage of India, intellectual and spiritual, can stand any challenge from any intellectual part of the world. That strength is there, we don't know. We know so little about it, it is good to know. Therefore, in this scientific, what you call memorial lecture, I have tried to give you this Western approach through physical science. We also had physical science. India developed tremendous physical science. The Arabs took over, many of these things passed on to Europe, that everybody knows today. Hundred years ago we never knew. Now we understand, yes, we had physical science plenty in India, but we found a greater science, that is the science of man in depth. Man is the greatest mystery. And today, in Western science also, among all the mysteries, man is the greatest mystery. Physical science is a mystery. The physical world, the sky is a mystery. Microscopic events are mystery. Deal with a human being, he is the greatest mystery. So, what you get at the end of physical science? Mystery, mystery, mystery. Have we understood nature? No. No scientist will say we have understood nature. We can control it, manipulate it. We don't know what it is. And I am quoting from Sir James Jean in his book, The New Background of Science. The development and history of modern physical science has become reduced to the extraction of one incomprehensible from another incomprehensible. That's what has happened. The mysterious universe. Imagine a scientist writing, in spite of 400 years of tremendous scientific development, the world is still a mystery. And Vedanta will whisper, keep it as a mystery. Clear the other mystery, then this also will be clear. One aspect you have completely neglected, completely removed from your think thinking. Now wait until this is done, this will remain a deeper and deeper mystery. This wind is blowing on the Western world today. That first wind that blew the breeze of scientific investigation to the world of nature, let us study what it is, let us understand what it is, that is beautiful. Now comes a new breeze. Turn your center of study from the sense data to what lies beyond the sensory level. There you have something profound. I am quoting a famous article that appeared in Siemens Journal on this subject. One writer was writing. The modern age started at the age of exploration. I am quoting the article, the substance of it. The modern age started as an age of exploration. Columbus explored the ocean and discovered the American continent. Vasco de Gama came from west to east, discovered this part of the world where they are concerned. Then we started exploring the bottom of the ocean, then height of the mountains, Mount Everest, Alps, etc. Then North Pole, then South Pole. Every square inch of the world we have explored. Now, we were not satisfied. Man is a restless creature. If he gets something, he wants something more, something more. As nature of human says, quest for knowledge. I'm asking what the article is telling you, is it this point of view? Then we started going up into the sky, started sending rockets, 60 miles, 70 miles rocket went and fell down. Finally, we got a rocket to take a man to the moon. Now, Voyager is going beyond the solar system. Now, that's called the modern world. Then he says, now, the most important sentence comes later, but there is one exploration we have yet to undertake. What is that? The hinterland of our own mind. What is behind our mind? We don't know anything. Absolutely dark it is to us. That's going to be the most tremendous subject for this modern age. So men like Wheeler, J.H. Wheeler, nuclear scientist, now in the uh, Austin University of Texas, they say there, Eugene Whitmer, another great scientist, he is the best one to understand what lies behind this mind. They must go to India. They have developed this subject wonderfully well. The nature of consciousness. Man of the observer, 
this consciousness, the tremendous data, we ignored it. Today you find it's getting larger and larger in size, more and more important on the horizon at the importance of the subject for tomorrow's lecture. That how they discovered what lies the hinterland of consciousness. The Upanishads did this wonderful work, the heritage for all humanity. They did this as science. They did it for human fulfillment. And what they did has remained stern and firm and so beautiful even up to this day, 4,000 years later. How could they do so? They were only motivated by love of truth, not love of trauma, love of creed. Max Muller has given a tribute. The great sages of India, the Upanishads, they, they built up this powerful, enduring edifice of thought called Vedanta. Thousands of years existing, strong and steady, meeting the challenge of modern science. How could they do so? Because they had only one passion, passion for truth and passion for human happiness and welfare. They pursue truth with a single-minded devotion. How could they do so? And he gives the answer. They had no public to please or critics to appease. Therefore, they could pursue truth. That is the subject tomorrow where we shall see this wonderful development that took place in India about 4,000 years ago in parts of Punjab, the Delhi area, UP, part of Bihar, part of Madhya Pradesh in that area, including Afghanistan. All that area is the area where this tremendous spiritual, intellectual ferment took place, the fruit of which is the wonderful it is called the Upanishad. That's why if culture is mind duplicating itself, a tremendous duplication took place in this country as a tremendous inheritance we all have, and that is a human inheritance, not for India only. Science is universal. It may develop in England or France, but science itself is universal. Similarly, it is that developed in India, but it is a science. It is meant for all humanity. That is the greatness of the great subject, which many of us do not know in India, and because of that, there is greater harmony in this country. Now we forget it, there is disharmony, communal conflict, all sorts of evils in society. We don't know the subject, but it is good to know this subject and know it as a sign. It is a sign. It is a bit here. It is not any kind of magic or miracle or something. Most of us understand only religion, magic and miracles, but this is pure sign. It can be experimented. That approach I shall deal with tomorrow when you will come across beautiful passages, Dubanishas, Srimad Bhagavatam, and all these wonderful great books, and parallel to what you find in physical science. So Vedanta accepts science. Science yet doesn't accept Vedanta, because science is still a sectarian entity. It has not understood that physical science is an adjective. Take away physical, then science becomes science. Then you will find Indian thought as science itself. So Ramarola said, Vivekananda's Vedanta accepts science. Though science itself may not accept Vedanta, that shows a larger circle can include a smaller circle also. That is how you will understand the greatness of Vedanta. We call it therefore in the Gita. Krishna tells you, among all the sciences, and the science of spirituality, Adhyatma Vidya Vidyana, any science can flourish if this spirituality is more there. Spirituality doesn't mean ritual, ceremony, going to temple, etc. A profound love of truth as a scientist is itself part of spirituality. He is spiritual not knowing that he is spiritual. That's a wonderful idea. So that you will realize later on. Today we are all ashamed to say these are great ideas of India. Because what will the West say? We are ashamed of it. But that shame will go. I'm glad to say more scientists in India are realizing that India had a tremendous scientific heritage both in the physical as well as in the spiritual field. We lost it for the last thousand years. We are now regaining that old scientific tradition with the help of Western scientific progress. That is the situation today, so we shall meet tomorrow and continue this great subject. Namaskar.